Hello there everyone, UXW Bill here with you once again, and today I'm answering a video request from fellow YouTuber V Westlife. He happened to see the RCA Victor clock radio that you're looking at right now in the background on a previous video that I had made, and he asked me if I could find something to say about it and make a video discussing it. Well, I didn't initially have a plan to make a video about this particular clock radio, but I decided that I could probably find a couple of intelligent things to say about it. And so now I present to you a video featuring the RCA RHS 33E model AM FM clock radio. I don't know when exactly this set was made, but I would guess sometime around the late 1960s, early 1970s based on its styling. And it must have been a pretty nice model when it was new because it tunes not only the standard broadcast or amplitude modulation, sometimes called medium wave band, it also tunes the entirety of the FM band from 88 to 108 megahertz. In addition to featuring FM band tuning, it was also offered in a couple of different color schemes. There were a total of three. This one is the white model with a black face. There were also brown and blue models. I presume the majority of the coloring change centered around the front panel, as the basis for all of them is a white cabinet. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of the features offered by this thing. I guess we'll go ahead and start over here at the left hand side where the clock is located. You can see there are two knobs on the front here. This knob is the mode of operation adjustment knob. It allows you to choose between turning the radio on, turning the radio off, using the radio as a wake up alarm source, or using an actual alarm buzzer. In the middle we have the clock face with, with a total of four hands. There is the hour hand, the alarm hand, the minute hand, and of course the smoothly sweeping second hand. As this radio uses a 110, 120 volt, 60 cycle per second synchronous motor to drive the clock movement, the second hand movement is very smooth. Kind of a nice looking thing, certainly gives it an extra aura of class compared to a clock movement where the second hand actually ticks. On the right hand side of the clock face, we have a second knob. This allows you to dial in the sleep timer. The sleep timer would allow the radio to play for X amount of time before it automatically switched itself off. So if you are one of those people who happen to enjoy listening to the radio before you doze off to sleep, this model certainly has you covered. Moving over to the right hand side of the unit, we have the AM dial and the FM dial. And if you look at these particularly closely, Although the two dials are tied together internally and they move together when the tuning knob is operated, they are not exactly positioned in the same way. And I don't know if this was true when the set was manufactured and it just wasn't manufactured to that high of a tolerance, or if there has been some slip in the tuning uh, drive cord over the years. I would guess that there might have been some slip, especially if anyone ever happened to turn the tuning dial particularly far past its limits or stops. On the bottom, we have the RCA Victor logo, then we have a volume control, which does not double as a power switch, since again the power switch is over here as part of the clock mechanism. We have a band switch. The band switch allows you to tune uh, the AM band, the FM band, or FM with automatic frequency control, which is a kind of automatic fine tuning. It frees you from having to adjust the set for minor deviations in tuning on an FM station. We'll go ahead and turn the set around and we'll take a look at the back side here. And as you can see, make sure that it's still in frame here, we have an information plate featuring the three models and their different color schemes. The RHS 33A was white with blue. The RHS 33E, this model, was white with black. And the RHS 33T was white with brown. The frequency range tuned is on AM 540 to 1600 kilocycles, and the FM tuning range is 88 to 108 megacycles. Both bands are still in use here in the United States and most of the rest of the world today. So this radio is certainly still useful if you happen to come across one. But as I'll tell you later, unfortunately it probably could use some restoration before we'll be able to use it. There is a caution notice explaining that no user serviceable parts are present inside this unit, and here is the serial number. There's also a notification about how to make use of an external antenna hookup 
The AM antenna is the conventional ferrite iron loop stick with many windings of wire wrapped around it. A very simple but effective directional AM antenna. The FM antenna by default is attached to the line cord. So it uses your household wiring system in order to receive FM broadcasts. It's kind of mediocre, but it works acceptably well most of the time. But if you did have an exterior FM antenna or a better FM antenna to hand, you could hook it up to this set and use it. And of course, this set was manufactured by the Radio Corporation of America, what we today know as RCA. Unfortunately, the true RCA was bought out by General Electric in the mid to late 1980s, by 1986, I believe, and today, RCA is nothing more than a brand slapped onto products by random, typically Chinese, manufacturers. Truly an unfortunate end for a once great company that brought us such innovations, though certainly not without controversy, such as the color television system, the NTSC color television system, and those sorts of things as well. Now, if you look at this set and you're familiar with old radios, you'll notice that the power cord is actually molded into the back panel. Despite that old design, which was usually seen on tube-type equipment, since tube-type equipment usually had no power transformer in it whatsoever, it used a series string arrangement and also made things such that the metal chassis inside the unit could potentially end up being connected to the AC line, this was a cost-saving measure. The tubes were selected so that each tube's filament voltage would add up to, oh, about 110, 120 volts. This transformerless design also had the ability to operate on direct current, which was still in use in some small portions of the United States up until, oh, probably the 1950s, 60s, somewhere in there. In fact, there are still a few isolated pockets of the United States, especially in buildings with very old elevators that still have part of their electrical system running on direct current instead of today's alternating current. This particular radio is designed for AC operation only, and unlike the tube type equipment of years past, I don't believe this unit has a hot chassis. There is a power transformer inside it which would provide for line ins isolation from direct connection to the power line. So this is kind of a holdover design. The old tube type equipment had a removable plug that was molded into the back panel for safety's sake. The idea was to prevent the end user from being able to inadvertently touch the chassis to change a tube or to service something inside while it was potentially energized. Now service technicians who worked on these sets had what was called a cheater cord, which was basically this assembly without the back panel. So they could make adjustments and work on the set with it plugged in, but the back disconnected. So that's the explanation for the power cord. Definitely a hold over here because this set is fully solid state, completely transistorized. If you're one of the younger members of the crowd and unfamiliar with the term solid state, here we have the clock and alarm setting dial. The way that this particular control works it pulls in and it pulls out. When you pull it out, you're setting the clock. When you push it in, you're setting the alarm. And then next to that, rounding out the features on the back panel, we have an ovoid opening for the rear firing speaker. And I love this stamped cardboard design. I suppose it was as cheap as anything for RCA to use this. You can see that there's just a pair of plastic push rivets here that hold the speaker in place. But I, what can I say? It looks almost like a football. You can imagine the laces going right down the middle there. Unfortunately, that concludes the good news portion of our broadcast as I turn the set back around to face the camera. As with many early electronics, from the early days of radio up through about the late 1960s or so, this set has a problem that is common amongst equipment that old. To demonstrate that problem, I turn it on. It's not really a good idea to do that, but the truth is my father had already done it before I ever knew about this. He became disgusted. He was going to throw the radio in the trash, but I told him, no, please don't do that. I have someone who wants to see a video about it on my YouTube channel. And what's more, this problem is very easy to fix. The failure here is bad filter capacitors inside the unit. When the filter capacitors are working properly, they filter out the 60 cycle hum from the AC power line. When they are no longer working properly, the result is a deafening hum. It is very loud, 
totally unaffected by the volume control because it's getting into the circuitry before the preamplifier or anything can have anything to do about it. Powering up a piece of equipment like this, just plugging it into the wall, is seldom a good idea. But when someone's already done it before you, things probably can't get a whole heck of a lot worse. The proper way to do this is to use something like a dim bulb tester, which is a light bulb in series with the device that you're going to test, or even a variable audio auto transformer, sometimes called a Variac, which is a trademark, to bring up the power slowly to the unit and make sure that nothing's going to smoke or start on fire. Otherwise, firing up your old radio or television uh, treasure that you've just found might be an unfortunately literal and miserable experience when it does catch on fire. So if you find an old radio or television, by all means, resist the temptation to plug it in until some basic checks have been made. Because the television or radio that you save could very well be your own. Fortunately, this problem can be fixed, and sometimes you can fix it, again, as a stopgap measure, by using the so-called dim bulb tester or the variable auto transformer. If you bring up the power and the current and the voltage slowly to the set, you might have some luck reforming the electrolytic capacitors. Now, many times it's a lost cause, but for a piece of equipment like this, which is new enough to be solid state, i.e. fully transistorized, well, if you do that slowly and gradually enough, you might reform the capacitors just enough to confirm that there is nothing wrong with the rest of the set. Speaking of the rest of the set, the next thing I plan to do, just as soon as I've unplugged it here and popped the back cover off, is to show you what's going on inside of it. So stay tuned, we'll be right back. I'm back and I have just finished the removal of the rear cover of this radio. You can see the speaker that is stuck to the back here along with the plastic rivets, at least one of them that hold it in. You can also see the lead running over here to the FM antenna that is ultimately attached via loose coupling to the power cord. One thing's for sure, RCA did not go out of their way to make this unit exceptionally easy to put back together. I've had the back off of it once and let's just say it's kind of a delicate ballet to get the tabs to engage in just the right place and also to get the power plug to go back where it belongs to these mating pins on the circuit board. This power cord may actually need to be replaced because the one thing I've noticed is there's a lot of corrosion on these pins here. The power cord insulation is also stained green in some places which makes me think that the copper wiring inside of it has probably suffered some damage as well. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of the compo components inside the set. Here is the previously mentioned rear mounted speaker, the plastic rivets that are holding it in. They look almost like motherboard standoffs that you'd see in a computer case today. Back here we have the clock movement. I am not sure who manufactured this clock movement. In truth, when I popped this thing open I really expected that I would see the oh so common Telecron General Electric movement of the time, but there's no brand on this. It's definitely not Telecron's style of construction, at least not that I'm familiar with. So no idea who made it. It does look kind of cheap, but it must get the job done because all these years later it's still keeping excellent and precise time. These line operated clocks typically do very, very well because they use the highly stable AC power line frequency as their timing reference. So they do very well unless the power happens to go out. Here on the circuit board, this thing actually is new enough, as most transistorized equipment is, to utilize a printed circuit board. This is the AM loop stick antenna wrapped around the iron form. We have a number of alignment adjustments here in case the set ever needed to be serviced or components drifted or were replaced with components having slightly different tolerances that the set could be brought back into good fighting trim. Here we have the tuning dial arrangement and the variable capacitor. And this kind of pains me to see this, the way that RCA did this. It looks like there may not be any way to get the circuit board out of here without disturbing the tuning dial stringing. And I'm really not very good at stringing tuning dials. I'd also, I also don't happen to have any service literature for this particular unit. Here we have the AC power terminals bringing power to the unit. You can see how a modern day simple power cord could slip onto these and allow you to make your own cheater cord easily and safely in the privacy of your own home. Just be careful that you know the ramifications before you can do. Number of early transistors on the board. Um, 
and they all have that lovely round can design that you love so much. There's a fairly large power resistor here. I don't know what this ceramic power resistor is doing. If it's dropping line voltage down to a more acceptable value for the transformer over here, or what the case might be. Now over here we have a large stamped piece of metal. This is actually a heat sink. The primary audio output transistor is mounted to it, so obviously this thing's got a fairly decent audio output stage, though it looks like it's just single-ended to me. There are some numbers stamped in this. It says 6385. I don't know, but that might be a date code. Although I don't think this thing could be from as early as 1963. You will also notice if we zoom inside the unit here, and we may need a little additional light to do this, so let's see if the Handycam light can help me out here. Well, it certainly helped a little bit, but I think we need more light than that still. Let me see if I can get my fluorescent light over here without it falling all over the place. The original filter capacitor is still sitting back here installed in the set. It's this large, large cardboard tube. It looks to be a... Uh, looks to be... what does that say? I can't quite read it for sure. I'm not sure who manufactured it, but sitting right next to it on the circuit board, not very far away from another ceramic power resistor, is a much more modern electrolytic capacitor. I don't know if that's a service part, if somebody was in this set. It's not new, I'll tell you that. But I think the entirety of this set's woes, or at least a great many of them, certainly that obnoxious hum, could be completely resolved by simply replacing this capacitor. Because these capacitors are almost invariably bad. It's seldom, if ever, worth wasting your time with them. In fact, you're probably just wasting your time to even try reforming them like I discussed earlier. Although in that case, the only thing that you've lost is about a penny's worth of electricity. Inside this cabinet, there's some interesting discoloration over here on the radio side of the electronics. I have no idea what might have happened here, if maybe the set's been a little bit hot over the years, or if that's just some kind of flash or overspray or something from the manufacturing process. The set really doesn't have any other smell to it other than that which is typically associated with old electronic devices that have been rediscovered for the first time in a long time. But that black spot there, if it were nearer to some active components on this circuit board, other than just the variable capacitor, which is fairly passive in nature, well, it would give me a little bit of cause for concern. As it is, I think it's probably just the lack of paint spray or something like that when the unit was put together at the factory. So, this is another thing that's going to be added to my list, my ever-growing, my infinitely long list of items to repair. <laughs> This is the RCA RHS 33 clock radio. Overviewed for your pleasure here on the UXW Bill channel. As always, thank you for watching, and by all means, feel free to leave a comment if you have one.